One of the problems that seems to me plagues a lot of evangelicalism is the failure to unite Paul and Jesus in the gospel. Very often you hear the gospel described as simply the death and resurrection of Jesus. But that's not the whole story because Jesus preached the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom that is, for many years until in Matthew 16, 21, he began to say, now listen to this, I'm going to go and die and be raised. But what about all of that gospel preaching that precedes the announcement of his death and resurrection? And one doesn't want then to pit Paul against Jesus and make Paul give us what turns out to be, would turn out to be a reduced gospel, ignoring the vital information in the gospel provided by Jesus. So, in order to rectify this unfortunate tendency, let's look at the Kingdom of God texts in the book of Acts to show that those noble pioneers of the faith there, evangelizing with all their hearts, concentrated always on the Kingdom of God. Luke is brilliant. He writes before the cross and after the cross, and he wants us to be absolutely certain, beyond any kind of doubt, that the Kingdom of God is still the heart and core of the Gospel which is only reasonable since Jesus is the founder of our Christian faith and his gospel was always the kingdom of, the kingdom of God gospel. So in Acts there are eight wonderful kingdom texts which you should have posted on your refrigerator, have them memorized and have them ready to go at any opportunity. In Acts 1.3 you remember that Jesus reappeared. Here I am, he said, it's me, myself, I'm alive. And he proceeded then to continue with the subject that was, that was always his passion an obsession, you might say, with the Kingdom of God, and lectured them on the Kingdom of God for six weeks or so in Acts 1-3. And then at the end of that series of lectures by Jesus, they asked a very intelligent question. They said in Acts 1-6, this is our second of the eight verses, Is it now time for you to restore national sovereignty or kingdom to Israel? That, of course, was exactly the right question. Beware here of Calvin, who says there are more errors in that question than there are words. You couldn't be worse off track than that if you tried hard. No, that's the right question, because the kingdom of God does involve national sovereignty in Israel in the future, and the whole kingdom immortalization program coming to its climax in the future. So, Jesus said simply, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. He didn't for one moment say, you're all too Jewish, too nationalistic, forget the kingdom of God stuff. That would have been to deny his whole own ministry. So then the next kingdom text will appear in Acts 8.12. Marvellous verse, because it summarizes exactly what a believer in the first century had to believe before he was ready to be baptized. So in Acts 8.12 it says, When they believed Philip, compare this with Abraham believed God, it was counted as making him right rather than wrong. When they believed Philip, they said, Yes, Philip, we understand what you're saying. But what was, what was Philip talking about? The kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom, and the things concerning Jesus. Everything to do with Jesus' ministry, including, of course, his death and resurrection, the second coming. But the kingdom of God is still the heart and core, the label of the evangelistic program there in Acts 8.12. When they believed Philip, they grasped enough information. It may have taken hours to get this transmitted to them, then they were ready to be baptized in water, of course, both men and women. This discussion currently about whether water baptism is part of the package is incredible to me. It's absolutely plain that Jesus himself was baptized, that Jesus baptized others in water, and baptism is simply what you do. To argue about the necessity of water baptism is to confuse everything and to make simple things impossibly difficult. So Acts 8.12 really should be a slogan for all churches. When they grasp the information about the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus Christ, then they were getting baptized. You can see them lining up to go down into the water, both men and women. Wonderful summary text. It's a John 3.16 par excellence, that verse, Acts 8.12. Then we move on to Acts 14.22, where... The speaker there warns people it's through much tribulation that were destined to enter the kingdom. That being the end point, the end game of the salvation program is the kingdom of God to enter it, to inherit it as a possession when Christ comes back. But it's through much trial 
and tribulation because the Christians are, so to speak, the Navy SEALs in training. God is training his royal family for the coming kingdom and he wants to see what's in our hearts before he lets us loose on world government, which he will do at the second coming. Then one moves to Acts 19.8 for the next kingdom of God text, these eight vitally important gospel of the kingdom texts in the book of Acts. In 19 verse 8 you'll find there Paul arguing for a lengthy period, I think not from dawn till dusk, but for a certain length of time, let's say three months, on another occasion two years, another occasion from dawn till dusk, Paul is lecturing on the kingdom of God, arguing the kingdom of God, trying to persuade people about the kingdom of God in Acts 19 verse 8. Paul, you know, was an arguer in the best sense. He was a persuader. Nothing wrong with arguing if you're trying to prevent people from believing error, that being poison in their system. If you're trying to enlighten them with the truth, you do your best to argue them into the truth. And Paul was doing that right here in Acts 19 verse 8. Then we move on to Acts chapter 20. And in the 24th verse, incidentally, you'll find that Paul was preaching the gospel about the grace of God. And you all say amen in a hearty fashion there, the gospel about the grace of God. But I've heard people lecture on that verse and stop short by failing to mention the next verse. What was this preaching of the gospel about the grace of God? Acts 20 verse 25 tells you it was heralding the kingdom of God. Of course, that was still the gospel. It was the gospel from the beginning. Mark uh, announced Jesus coming into Galilee, preaching God's gospel, the gospel about the kingdom. From that point onwards, throughout the New Testament to the last verse of Revelation, and incidentally, book of Revelation is 22 chapters of Jesus, showing the end point, how the kingdom of God finally is established amidst the chaos of human governments that don't want the kingdom to come. So there it is, the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20 verse 24, which is synonymous exactly with the gospel proclamation, the kirisin, the heralding word in Greek, of the gospel of the kingdom. Now if that's not enough, and if Luke has not persuaded you and me here yet, to believe that the gospel of the kingdom is the center of Christianity, he does his level best to impress it upon us in a further and final shot in Acts 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts. There in verse 23, the Jews are coming to, to Paul, who, this, who by this time was under house arrest and about to have his head chopped off not much later by the Roman government. And Paul then is arguing with Jews in the 23rd verse of the 28th chapter, preaching the gospel about the kingdom. There it is. That's the summary of the Christian faith, the gospel about the kingdom. And then a final, final shot is given us in the 28th verse. I'm sorry, beyond that, the 31st verse, 30 and 31, the final verses of Acts, where Paul is seen again on this occasion to be talking to Gentiles. The story was that after preaching the kingdom to the Jews in the 23rd verse, some of them got angry with Paul, some believed, some didn't, and they left in a huff, so to speak. And so Paul said, all right, now I'll go to the Gentiles with the same message, no difference at all, one gospel for everyone, and it's the gospel about the kingdom of God, which Paul preached endlessly for two whole years, tirelessly preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the things concerning Jesus at Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. That makes a total of eight wonderful kingdom verses. We very seldom hear the phrase gospel of the kingdom. Much less do we hear sermons on the kingdom of God and what the gospel of the kingdom is all about. I think it was Gary Birch who wrote that the gospel as he knows it and as his friends know it seems to be so tiny a part of the real thing as to call in question whether it really is the gospel. So let's expand our gospel to include the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom, including, of course, the all-essential death and resurrection of Jesus.